This is Dr. Hessel dictating the podcast on anticoagulants, scheduled for Monday, October 5th. Uh, the study questions will be posted on Wiki on uh, October 5th. Uh, you may also wish to refer to my podcast on the same topic uh, a, a couple years ago. These are the reading assignments that you were given. You may also find this particular supplement to journal of cardiothoracic vascular surgery helpful. Uh, this is a list of some of the things that I think you need to know regarding this topic. And this is an outline of what we're going to cover in this podcast. Um, the drugs uh, involved include in the anticoagulants, uh, both the parenteral agents and the oral agents, <clears throat> including the new oral agents that are underlined at the bottom. Uh, this is from Miller's uh, textbook, 8th uh, edition, uh, listing uh, the various anticoagulant agents. The other Drugs include the antiplatelet agents and uh, the thrombolytics. And again, this is from Miller's uh, textbook uh, this, uh, describing the antiplatelet agents. I also uh, refer to an update on the uh, new oral agents, which was produced by our P&T committee and these are summarized on the next few slides. Uh, above are listed the mechanisms of these various drugs, and below are the FDA-approved indications for these drugs. Uh, uh, this compares the pharmacokinetics of these uh, new drugs and uh, their contraindications and precautions. And finally, this is the cost of these drugs uh, to uh, University of Kentucky. Obviously, uh, to understand these drugs and their effects, uh, you must uh, understand normal coagulation. Uh, this is not the major point of this uh, podcast, uh, but I've uh, reviewed them on the next few slides. Uh, these, of course, are the uh, normal coagulation factors, and uh, this slide indicates their in vivo half-life. Uh, this shows uh, the classic intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, uh, and this is another diagram showing uh, these pathways. Um, primary hemostasis occurs uh, with the interaction of platelets with the endothelium. And uh, this shows how the platelets are activated um, to then um, react uh, uh, via the Van Willebrand factor to the uh, subendothelial matrix. Uh, this uh, goes into more detail about uh, this interaction of platelets uh, with the uh, subendothelium. Um, in the last few years, there's uh, been uh, a lot of interest in the so-called cell-based model of coagulation, and these two review articles are particularly helpful. Um, this uh, shows the, uh, illustrates the uh, basis of this cell-based model um, initiated by uh, uh, fibroblasts uh, amplified by the platelets. Uh, which are then activated. Um, this uh, shows uh, the reaction then uh, to the activated uh, uh, platelets. Another important uh, aspect of uh, this balance is endogenous fibrin lysis, and of course we sometimes use it therapeutically. Uh, this uh, summarizes the endogenous fibrinolytic system uh, uh, in the body. So plasminogen uh, 
is converted to plasmin uh, with uh, uh, TPA and urokinase. Uh, this step is blocked by antifibrinolytic agents. Uh, the plasmin then stimulates the uh, conversion of uh, fibrinogen to fibrin. You uh, must also uh, uh, be familiar with laboratory testing of uh, coagulation. And I divide these uh, into conventional tests, uh, tests of fibrinolysis, and tests of platelet function. Uh, the conventional uh, tests, of course, include the PT slash INR, the activated PTT, thrombin time, fibrinogen, and a platelet count. Uh, fibrinolysis is uh, assessed uh, with uh, uh, thrombin uh, time uh, fibrin degradation products, uh, uh, fibrin D dimer assay, and missing from this slide is uh, the thromboelastography. Um, uh, finally, uh, platelet function. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, on this, I've uh, summarized the uh, common laboratory tests of hemostasis and the normal range. This shows uh, the thromboelastography, uh, which you are uh, familiar with. And uh, this uh, pictorially uh, displays the various phases of activation with the uh, maximum amplitude uh, reflecting the interaction of uh, platelets and uh, uh, fibrinogen uh, and is uh, one of the uh, commonly used tests of platelet function. In addition, the um, loss of the MA over time uh, is a test of fibrinolysis. Uh, platelet function uh, is uh, been elusive uh, in the past. Uh, these are a number of references on, on platelet function monitors. And uh, most recently, this uh, review uh, in up to date. Uh, this is from uh, up to date, uh, showing the uh, established platelet function tests, and also on this slide the uh, newer uh, platelet function tests that uh, are available. Uh, uh, these include the, the platelet function analyzer uh, and verify now. Uh, Verify Now is uh, a test available in our laboratory, uh, but I believe they only use the P2Y12 uh, uh, analysis, which is used for those agents that uh, interfere uh, with uh, this mechanism. It is available in our laboratory 24-7. Uh, this shows uh, the various monitors and uh, uh, which ones are available as point of care. Uh, finally, uh, there's uh, so-called TAG platelet mapping, um, but unfortunately this is not available in our hospital at this time. Uh, so let me concentrate for the rest of the time on the perioperative management of patients receiving anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents. Um, there are a number of uh, patients in which this comes up, those with atrial fib, prosthetic heart valves, coronary stents, uh, DVT prophylaxis, and those scheduled to receive regional anesthesia. And uh, again, we can arbitrarily divide these uh, drugs uh, into the uh, uh, warfarin, new uh, oral anticoagulant drugs, uh, antiplatelet agents, and uh, missing from this slide, but obviously uh, heparin and low molecular weight heparin. Uh, this is a, a nice uh, review in up-to-date on the perioperative management of patients receiving anticoagulants. Uh, so uh, let me now turn to the reversal of these agents when patients uh, uh, either have uh, bleeding due to the agents or are uh, scheduled to have surgery. Um, uh, 
in which bleeding could be a problem. Uh, this is a summary uh, from uh, Article 10 uh, five years ago, but is still a fairly nice review of uh, uh, the emergent reversal of uh, the various uh, drugs that we're going to uh, talk about. Um, a major problem is that uh, uh, there is a growing number of patients who are receiving anticoagulation, either for uh, uh, prevention of venous thromboembolism or uh, for uh, uh, patients with atrial fibrillation. And it's estimated that uh, about 2% of our population are uh, receiving uh, vitamin K antagonists or uh, uh, even more uh, receiving new or oral anticoagulants. Um, this is from uh, Miller's uh, textbook of uh, five years ago uh, showing uh, the various anticoagulant agents. Um, their uh, route of administration, uh, plasma half-life and antidotes, and how long before procedure uh, discontinuing is recommended. Uh, we'll go into this in a little more detail. Um, so uh, these are the traditional anticoagulants uh, that uh, uh, have been used with uh, uh, vitamin K antagonist warfarin being the gold standard until the last uh, few years. Uh, uh, warfarin has uh, many issues uh, with it, uh, including inconvenience, uh, poor compliance, uh, uh, a narrow therapeutic window, and for this reason, the uh, new oral anticoagulants have uh, gained uh, popularity. Um, this uh, shows uh, the site of action of uh, these uh, various uh, uh, anticoagulants. Uh, Let's talk uh, now about uh, the reversal of warfarin. Uh, this again is nicely reviewed uh, by two uh, articles in Up to Date. Um, uh, this one on the general topic and this one on uh, patients with intracerebral uh, bleeding. Uh, this uh, shows the conundrum uh, with uh, warfarin, uh, uh, namely that if you don't get enough, uh, you get thrombosis, and if you give too much, uh, you have hemorrhage. Um, this uh, two uh, graphs nicely show uh, the uh, uh, problem. Uh, the red line showing thromboembolism, and of course this is high when they're not having adequate anticoagulation, and seems to reach a minimum with an INR of somewhere around two. Uh, conversely, uh, the risk of of uh, bleeding, uh, in this case uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, um, is relatively low until the INR starts to exceed uh, three. Um, this shows uh, the uh, major uh, risk of, of bleeding uh, in uh, patients uh, who are receiving uh, uh, warfarin uh, or aspirin uh, in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, uh, comparing the rate of major bleeding uh, with warfarin uh, with aspirin and with nothing. And uh, you can see that uh, the risk of uh, bleeding on uh, patients on warfarin is uh, somewhere around um, uh, 2 to 4%, uh, and the risk of intracerebral bleeding is somewhere around a half uh, to 1%. This is uh, the uh, so-called has bled uh, bleeding risk score. Um, um, 
and it takes into account uh, various uh, parameters and uh, then uh, based on the, the total score uh, this shows the instance of, of bleed uh, per 100 patient years. This is a uh, uh, scale for predicting the risk of bleeding on warfarin and uh, um, you add up uh, uh, the number of risk factors um, and uh, uh, for uh, a, a range from, from zero to four. Um, if there's no risk factors, uh, then the risk is 3%. Uh, if uh, there's one to two, 12%. And if it's uh, uh, three or four, uh, 53%. This uh, is the recommended uh, management of patients with supra-therapeutic INR uh, uh, for those uh, between therapeutic and five, uh, five to nine, uh, greater than, than nine, and any life-threatening bleeding. These are the various options uh, for uh, reversal of warfarin. Um, traditionally, uh, uh, this uh, consists of uh, uh, discontinuing warfarin uh, or giving vitamin K. Uh, the problem with vitamin K is it uh, takes uh, uh, at least uh, 24 hours to uh, uh, reverse the anticoagulation. Uh, uh, FFP is uh, the uh, most common uh, therapy until recently, uh, but uh, requires a, a fair amount of uh, uh, fluid and uh, uh, takes uh, a while for complete reversal. Uh, the uh, latest, uh, uh, in uh, the last few years, there was some interest in using uh, activated uh, factor 7A. Uh, however, uh, most recently, uh, the use of four-factor uh, PCC has uh, uh, taken over for emergent reversal, which we'll show in a few moments. This is uh, from uh, basic of anesthesia. Um, as indicated here, uh, warfarin uh, is common in our patients and its use unfortunately is a marker of, of mortality. Um, this uh, shows the effect of warfarin uh, 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 as to how long it takes for them to affect uh, the various uh, uh, factors. Uh, this is from uh, a review for, by Dr. Horlacher about uh, management patients uh, on uh, warfarin. Um, I've uh, summarized here the various options and the doses, uh, starting with vitamin K and then FFP, uh, prothrombin complex, and uh, activated factor uh, 7A. Uh, this uh, is the recommended dose of FFP uh, based on the INR. Um, when the INR is less than uh, 4, uh, 10 milliliters per kilo, uh, which uh, in an 80 kilogram person would be about 800 cc's. Um, and uh, if it's over 6, uh, 20, which would be uh, 1,600 milliliters and 5 or 6 units of FFP. Uh, the limitation here is the effect of volume loading on these patients and also the time it takes to administer it. Uh, this uh, next slide talks about the IV reversal, and uh, you can uh, see that uh, uh, when uh, ad administered uh, orally uh, in these uh, upper graphs, uh, it takes uh, uh, it takes about 24 hours to affect 
whereas when given intravenously, um, it uh, is effective uh, in about four hours. Uh, this uh, slide uh, shows uh, the effect of uh, uh, low IV doses uh, and uh, oral agents. Uh, notice that low IV doses have about the same speed as, uh, as oral drugs, uh, whereas uh, the higher dose uh, uh, was uh, uh, more rapid. Uh, the big advance in the last uh, couple of years in the United States uh, and for almost uh, a decade uh, elsewhere has been the availability of four-factor uh, PCCs. Uh, I have uh, summarized in the next few slides uh, several studies uh, which have documented the efficacy of four-factor uh, uh, prothrombin complex, which is now available in this country and in our pharmacy as K-Centra. This was a, a study by Sorodi uh, in 2013. You can see the rapid uh, correction of INR uh, within about uh, uh, less than an hour compared with plasma. And a, uh, another study published in uh, circulation uh, by Quinlan and colleagues uh, this uh, compares the three factor with the four factor the four factor is more effective and uh, is thought to be safer this is the four factor that's available in the United States and uh, you see that uh, it's unique in that uh, it uh, uh, not only contains uh, uh, factor seven, uh, notice that uh, the three factor does not contain factor seven, but in addition it has a number of uh, anticoagulant factors uh, which may explain uh, perhaps a lower risk of thrombotic complications with the use of case centra. So currently the indications for use of the four factor uh, is uh, serious bleeding or major surgery with serious risk of bleeding when fast reversal is critical where volume loading is a concern. But remember that you must also give vitamin K because the duration of action um, is only a few hours. The duration of action of the four-factor PCC. This is the, the latest uh, paper uh, comparing a four-factor PCC with uh, um, um, FFP. Um, this summarizes the methods of their study and uh, their findings and the conclusion was that the four-factor PCC was not inferior but in fact was superior to plasma for rapid INR reversal and effective hemostasis in patients uh, needing uh, reversal of vitamin of warfarin uh, for urgent surgery or invasive procedures. Uh, this uh, slide shows uh, the speed with which uh, uh, the INR uh, is uh, corrected uh, uh, with the four-factor versus plasma and uh, uh, the percent of patients who uh, receive uh, normal levels. Uh, and you can see it's uh, markedly uh, faster with the four-factor PCC. Uh, this compares uh, uh, the efficacy of uh, the drug, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, effective hemostasis, which was a primary endpoint, 
and uh, rapid INR reversal, uh, which was the co-primary endpoint of that study. Let's turn then to the new oral anticoagulants. Um, and uh, this slide shows the evolution of uh, oral anticoagulants, uh, starting with aspirin and then warfarin and um, the P P2Y12, and uh, finally the, the newer oral anticoagulants, which are either direct uh, antithrombin uh, agents or uh, anti-10A agents. Uh, this is a nice uh, review of the management of bleeding in patients receiving these. The problem is that at the moment there are no proven uh, antagonist uh, antidotes for these agents, unlike uh, what there is for, for warfarin. Um, um, this shows uh, uh, from that uh, review article, uh, review in up to date. Uh, uh, the best uh, estimate of what to use uh, for uh, uh, dabagantran and uh, what to use uh, for the, uh, this is, a, of course, a direct thrombin inhibitor and for the uh, factor 10A inhibitors. Uh, for the factor 10A, it seems clear that uh, the four-factor PCC is uh, the best uh, available at the moment. Um, it's less clear uh, what is best uh, for uh, the uh, uh, dabagantran, uh, but uh, activated PCC, so-called fib uh, FIBA, is uh, currently recommended. This is a, a review article uh, from uh, 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 a few years ago uh, uh, indicating uh, about these new oral anticoagulants. Uh, and their advantages over over warfarin uh, versus their their disadvantages. The major one being that there's no way to assess the anticoagulant effect, and there's no reliable uh, reversal agent, and there can be problem in dosing elderly and patients with renal insufficiency. Um, the next few slides uh, pro provide details about these various agents. The first is dabagantran, uh, the direct uh, thrombin inhibitor. This shows uh, the usual dose, uh, which must be modified uh, in patients with renal uh, uh, insufficiency. This talks about dosing. And uh, monitoring. And reversal options. The next few slides talk about uh, river roxaban or Zorelta. Dosing considerations, monitoring, and reversal options. And finally, a pixabam or Eliquis. Dosing considerations, monitoring, reversal options. The P and T committee uh, of uh, UK has come out with a protocol for management of patients with critical bleeding who may or may not be on these agents. Um, 
in patients who present with problems. Um, you should get the labs outlined here. Um, if you're unable to obtain a past medical history from the family, uh, then uh, you have several options. Uh, uh, and uh, this uh, algorithm uh, uh, shows uh, the uh, uh, risk factors that would lead a patient to be on these drugs and uh, uh, how to guess uh, the cause, uh, starting with the PTT, uh, the thrombin time, uh, the INR, and uh, reaching a conclusion about the probable cause and uh, the therapy to, to use. This is a uh, uh, summary of uh, coagulation evaluation in patients with these various drugs and um, a summary uh, of uh, the uh, reversal agents for these uh, various uh, drugs. You can see that uh, for uh, direct thrombin inhibitors, FIBA is recommended for the factor 10A inhibitors, K-Centra, for vitamin K, uh, K-Centra, If uh, antiplatelet agents are thought to be uh, a problem in patients, uh, then uh, uh, platelet uh, therapy is uh, recommended. Finally, uh, uh, there is hope on the horizon uh, with uh, agents which are being developed uh, to uh, specifically uh, reverse these newer oral agents. Uh, the most hopeful is uh, indarusumab, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, a reversal agent for uh, dabigantran, uh, and uh, it's anticipated that uh, it may be approved by the end of this year. Um, there are two other drugs, uh, one that is thought to reverse um, A inhibitors, and the third, which is thought to have a broad uh, uh, antagonist activity, but uh, these are uh, not uh, close to uh, approval. Finally, as uh, summarized in this uh, review article, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, we lack uh, high-quality evidence as to how to manage these patients. Finally, as far as antiplatelet drugs, um, uh, this uh, review in anesthesia uh, reviews these agents and uh, their management uh, during uh, the perioperative period. As you know, there are numerous uh, indications for antiplatelet drugs as summarized on this slide. Uh, this shows uh, the uh, common drugs, uh, their uh, side of action, plasma half-life, um, antidotes, how long they should stop before the procedure, and uh, what, if anything, they do to coag studies. This shows the side of action of uh, the various antiplatelet agents. Uh, and this shows uh, the properties of these uh, various uh, anti-platelet uh, uh, agents. Um, of the uh, uh, P2Y12 uh, receptor inhibitors, um, the original one, or not the original, but the one most commonly used was clopidogrel. Um, a problem with it is a relatively high incidence of non-responders. The good news is, though, that you can uh, do a test for this using Verify Now. And if they are non-responders, then you don't have to worry about adverse effects on bleeding. Uh, the newer agents, on the other hand, um, uh, are uh, 
nearly 100% effective, uh, but um, on, the, on the other hand, uh, they tend to, to last uh, longer. This uh, talks about the resistance of uh, patients to both aspirin and clopidogrel and the possible causes of this non-response. As for a reversal, uh, the main uh, stem of therapy is platelets, uh, but also some have advocated use of recombinant factor uh, 7A. Uh, neither of these has been documented in uh, studies uh, in, in patients. This uh, is a summary of one of the newer uh, P2Y12 antagonists, uh, Effian. And compares um, Effian with uh, uh, Clopidogrel. And finally, this is a summary of uh, Ticagrigal or Brillanta. This is, uh, again, from Dr. Horlocker's review and talks about the management of patients on antiplatelet therapy. Next, uh, let's turn to the uh, problem of patients with coronary stents. And again, there's a nice uh, review uh, in Up to Date. Uh, coronary stents uh, were initially bare metal to prevent restenosis following balloon angioplasty. However, the uh, foreign material increased the risk of thrombosis early post-implant, and therefore aspirin and uh, uh, clopidogrel, or Plavix, in the early days, uh, so-called dual antiplatelet therapy, are administered for a while to reduce this hazard. For bare metal, uh, this is usually continued uh, for uh, um, uh, a month. Unfortunately, bare metal stents tend to develop endothelial overgrowth, leading to late occlusion, and therefore drug-eluting stents were developed to remedy this problem. They are coated with drugs which inhibit endothelial growth. Uh, while they are better at preventing late stenosis, because they delay endothelialization, they pose an even greater risk of early thrombotic occlusion. Hence, prophylactic dual antiplatelet therapy is recommended for a longer period of time than with bare metal stents, uh, at least a year or perhaps forever. Drug-eluting stents, especially when used outside FDA indications, appear to be at significant higher risk of late thrombosis than bare metal stents, especially when dual antiplatelet therapy is discontinued. This is probably because uh, there is delayed endothelialization. Uh, for this reason, many cardiologists recommend patients with drug-eluting stents to be kept on dual antiplatelet therapy indefinitely if they can afford it and they are not at increased risk of bleeding complications. If we perform non-cardiac surgery during the vulnerable period, we run the risk of bleeding if we continue them and of acute thrombosis if we discontinue the antiplatelet drugs. Uh, the risk of thrombosis is likely aggravated because of the prothrombogenic nature of the perioperative period. The period of risk is ill-defined but decreases over time but is probably at least a year. The risk of thrombosis depends on many factors including vessel stented, etc. Stent thrombosis is classified as acute or late, and unfortunately, it's usually catastrophic, leading to either acute myocardial infarction or death. 
uh, in about 65% uh, of patients. Um, so what are our perioperative management options? One is to do first surgery. If they've had a balloon for a few days, if they've had a bare metal stunt at least a month, and if they've had a drug eluding stent at least a year. If we need to operate during the vulnerable period, uh, we have several options. The first choice is to continue dual antiplatelet therapy. The second, uh, and there's a typo here, is to continue aspirin, but discontinue, dual, uh, discontinue the uh, P2Y12 uh, drug, uh, but then resume it as soon as possible. The third choice is to discontinue both, but as soon as possible. The patient should be kept in the hospital until you resume dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, surgery should be done primarily in a facility with invasive cardiology. Uh, cardiology should be consulted, uh, notified about the patient, and they should be closely monitored for uh, acute myocardial ischemia. Uh, this is uh, from uh, a review article in ANA uh, talking about risk factors uh, for uh, uh, thrombosis in patients who undergo surgery with uh, uh, stents in place. Um, this shows uh, some of the various risk factors, uh, in, including the coronary anatomy, uh, the reason why the stent was placed in, and, and patient factors. The current recommendations for dual antiplatelet therapy, as I've indicated, for bare metal shunts, uh, a stents a month, and for drug eluding at least a year. So uh, the preferred preoperative stent uh, depends on the urgency of surgery. If surgery is necessary in less than a month, then balloon angioplasty or nothing is recommended. If you have a month to a year, then a bare metal stent is best. And, and if uh, you can wait for a year, then a drug eluding stent is the preferred. This is from the latest recommendation of the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, about the timing of elective non-cardiac surgery in patients with previous uh, PCI. Um, they recommend that elective non-cardiac surgery should be delayed for 14 days after balloon, for 30 days after bare metal stent, and for one year after drug eluding stent. However, they indicate that in patients in whom non-cardiac surgery is required, uh, that a consensus decision among treating clinicians, including uh, the surgeon, uh, the cardiologist, and the anesthesiologist, should be taken into consideration. Finally, they indicate that elective non-cardiac surgery uh, may be considered after s six months if the risk of further delay is greater than the expected risk of ischemia and stent thrombosis. This is a summary of uh, Dr. Cutlip's uh, recommendation as uh, published in Up to Date. Now, um, there is much data about regional anesthesia and anticoagulant drugs. Um, again, uh, UpToDate has a nice uh, review uh, published uh, recently. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, there are other review articles, including this one from the British Journal of Hematology, um, uh, this one from the European Journal of Anesthesia, and uh, the recommendations from the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. I believe you are all fairly familiar with these recommendations, and I will um, uh, go through these slides uh, uh, over the next uh, couple of minutes. Um, this is uh, the recommendations from the uh, uh, regional anesthesia.
me then turn to the topic of venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. This has been uh, reviewed uh, by Dr. Pai in Up to Date. Um, these are uh, from Horlocker's review article on risk factors for venous thromboembolism. And the recommendations for uh, thromboprophylaxis in hospitalized patients. This is an important uh, review article uh, which um, reviews uh, the uh, prevention of thromboembolism. And finally, uh, the P&T committee has come out with recommendations about VTE uh, prophylaxis. And uh, the primary uh, is that we have uh, uh, changed from uh, sub-Q unfractured heparin to use of low molecular weight heparin. This is the algorithm uh, that is uh, published uh, by UK Healthcare dividing patients into low risk and moderate to high risk. And this is these are the criteria for classifying someone as low risk, moderate risk or high risk. and how it's to be documented in the electronic medical record. This committee has also talked about the use of the newer oral anticoagulant drugs for DVT prophylaxis. And uh, they've reviewed the various uh, um, studies that have uh, uh, looked at this. Finally, uh, one cannot uh, overlook the role of intermittent pneumatic compression, although the emphasis is on uh, drug prophylaxis. Another important interaction between anesthesiologists and anticoagulation is the problem of patients with prosthetic heart valves. Uh, with uh, mechanical valves, uh, the annual rate of uh, thromboembolism um, uh, is about twice with mitral valves as with aortic valves. If they're on no drug, it's about 4%. If they're on aspirin only, about 2%. And if they're on warfarin, about 1%. For warfarin, the INR target uh, has gradually changed with newer valves. Um, uh, with the old Star Edwards valve, it was about 3 um, for the aortic valve, and now it's uh, closer to two. Um, with the mitral valve, um, uh, it uh, is about three. Um, some uh, have used aspirin only, and some have used uh, uh, Plavix, although this is not an FDA-approved in indication. For bioprosthesis, uh, they are at a low risk, and uh, generally only aspirin is recommended. However, in patients at higher risk, uh, 
i.e. those with uh, atrial fibrillation, low EF, large left atria, uh, warfarin is recommended by some. Uh, if a patient comes for non-cardiac surgery, uh, one should avoid vitamin K if possible because it then becomes difficult to re-anticoagulate uh, them. Uh, warfarin should be uh, uh, discontinued three to five days ahead of time. Um, uh, bridging with heparin is not recommended unless they are at high risk, as uh, summarized uh, on this slide. This is a uh, recent review that appeared in Up to Date. Uh, they have summarized the American College of Cardiology recommendations for patients with mechanical heart valves. Um, these are the recommendations from the American College of um, uh, Physicians uh, for patients with mechanical heart valves. Um, and these are the ACC recommendations for patients with bio prosthetic heart valves and the ACCP uh, guidelines for patients with bioprosthetic heart valves. Um, relevant uh, to discontinuing uh, anticoagulation is the risk of bleeding during the procedure and this uh, classifies those with with uh, relatively high risk namely uh, two to four percent versus those with a low risk of less than two percent and this might uh, influence rather one uh, opts to uh, discontinue uh, warfarin. This is also uh, uh, divides patients undergoing gastrointestinal procedures and uh, those that they call high risk procedure versus low risk procedure. Finally, these are the ACC guidelines for bridging therapy in patients with mechanical valves. Uh, in general, um, these uh, patients tolerate uh, being off anticoagulant. Uh, with the newer mechanical valves, these patients tolerate being off anticoagulation for uh, one to two weeks, and uh, therefore bridging is not generally recommended unless they have high risk features. And uh, these are described uh, on this table. Another common reason for anticoagulation is atrial fibrillation. Uh, this has uh, been reviewed in up to date, uh, and this shows uh, the uh, benefits of uh, traditional warfarin therapy uh, versus placebo in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, uh, there was a uh, question of rather one could use low-dose warfarin plus aspirin, so-called combination therapy. Uh, but as you can see, um, this uh, was is associated with an unacceptable risk of, of, uh, of uh, adverse thromboembolic events. The um, decision <clears throat> to anticoagulate uh, these patients is based on uh, two uh, risk classification systems, the so-called CHADS-2 and the CHADS-2 vascular risk. Uh, on the left-hand slide are the uh, scoring of these two systems, and on the right-hand side shows the risk of an ischemic stroke uh, depending on uh, what one score is. The clinician then, based on this risk, uh, balancing it with the risk of hemorrhagic complications, uh, decides um, who should be uh, received anticoagulation. Um, this shows uh, the comparisons of uh, v uh, warfarin versus uh, aspirin uh, on the incidence of stroke and major bleeding. Uh, in uh, patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, and this is a, a meta-analysis of uh, randomized trials. Um, the big change in uh, recent years has been uh, the use of newer oral anticoagulants, which we've discussed before. And uh, these uh, compare uh, the uh, uh, three trials, 
um, uh, as far as the uh, uh, incidence of um, uh, uh, outcome. This uh, shows the uh, thrombobolic risk um, versus heparin in various CHAD scores. Again, the UK P&T committee has come out with some guidelines for uh, uh, or uh, analysis of the use of the newer uh, oral anticoagulants uh, for uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, these are the five uh, uh, trials, uh, and uh, the results are uh, summarized on this slide. Finally, there was a uh, very recent uh, paper um, uh, published uh, in August uh, in which they studied uh, the need to bridge anticoagulation patients on atrial fibrillation. Um, basically, they compared uh, bridging uh, uh, with low molecular weight heparin uh, versus not bridging. And uh, they found that patients with atrial fibrillation who had been on warfarin, um, which was interrupted, uh, that uh, foregoing bridging was not inferior to perioperative bridging uh, with low molecular weight heparin for prevention of thromboembolism, uh, but did decrease the risk of major bleeding, and therefore they recommended not bridging these patients. Um, this slide just uh, indicates uh, some of the thrombolytic agents that uh, are used uh, at the present time and what their indications are. Uh, finally, although the topic of another major uh, uh, presentation is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, uh, this uh, classifies the uh, two types, uh, type 1, which uh, does not require treatment, and type 2, uh, which is a serious uh, hazard of both uh, uh, bleeding and uh, thrombo thrombosis. <clears throat> this uh, shows the presumed uh, pathophysiology of type 2 HIT. And again, uh, the uh, UK P&T committee has uh, developed guidelines for uh, the management of patients uh, with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, this uh, <clears throat> uh, talks about uh, the diagnosis including the initial assessment and laboratory studies uh, based largely on the so-called 4T, which um, estimates the pretest probability of HIT. If the pretest probability is low, you probably should not obtain the test. If the pretest probability is high, you should obtain it. Uh, you don't need to obtain it. Uh, you should obtain it. This shows uh, the uh, guidelines uh, for uh, initiating uh, uh, direct thrombin inhibitors uh, to treat uh, HIT uh, based on uh, the results of uh, various tests. Um, and uh, on the bottom uh, indicates uh, the uh, preferred uh, agents. Uh, this describes uh, these agents in more detail. Uh, the direct thrombin inhibitors, uh, argatroban and bivalirudin, uh, the factor 10A inhibitors, and uh, uh, the laboratory testing uh, for these agents. This shows uh, the uh, monitoring of argatroban on the left side and of bivalirudin on the right side. Uh, this is the guideline for the use of argatrib for the um, conversion 
of argatriban to uh, warfarin. It's important not to start warfarin in these patients until they have been uh, fully dosed on the uh, direct uh, any uh, direct uh, uh, thrombin inhibitors. These are the recommendations of uh, bivalley rudin dosing on the top for patients undergoing PCI, in the bottom, uh, in the middle for patients undergoing on pump coronary bypass, and uh, uh, next down uh, for patients undergoing off pump. Uh, uh, bypass, and uh, finally, um, uh, uh, patients with a history of HIT um, in which it's uh, resolved. And that completes this presentation.